I'm going to be speaking today about the profession of literary scholarship and the first person. <clears throat> and to get us past either confusion or embarrassment as to what I mean by the first person, I'll tell you right away that the first person is me. <laughs> and I, <clears throat> I want to add that uh, for those of you who are greatly relieved to hear uh, Annette's uh, reticence about the secrets of her family, if that's the kind of talk you prefer, abandon all hope ye who enter my talk. <laughs> <clears throat> Ten years ago, I gave uh, a keynote address at SAMLA, <clears throat> the southern version of the MLA, in which I located the project of, of reading, in particular the kind of reading, especially close reading that we do as uh, literary professionals, as between two poles, which I um, identified as narcissism and Wissenschaft. <laughs> I was understanding Wissenschaft it's something like an organized principle of study, a science, and so on. And as with most, uh, uh, without the necessary uh, connotation of being limited to chemistry and biology, uh, as with most opposing poles, they were meant to be extremes. The axis on which they found themselves in opposition had to do with the question whether literary reading ought to be understood as a scientific truth-telling enterprise on the one hand, or as an expression of the unique sensibility, the self of the reader. I meant both extremes to be undesirable, <clears throat> um, excessive, which seems obvious. But I wanted the identification of the grid to suggest two closely related things. First, that we must recognize ourselves as literary readers always operating between these extremes. And second, that we tended, whether we admitted it or not, to think of our professional reading activity as being closer to Wissenschaft than to narcissism. Then and now, of course, Wissenschaft sounds like a good thing, uh, and narcissism sounds like a bad thing. Uh, my hope was to cast a little blame on the good word and to offer a little boost to the bad word. <clears throat> Since I gave that talk, there has risen a practice called autocriticism. True to my own narcissistic tendencies, I'd never heard the word, and I heard the word and got exposed to its practitioners only after I published a whole book on which I used it upon Shakespeare without giving it that particular name. My point isn't about the priorities. <clears throat> uh, who cares? Uh, rather, I'm seeking in some small way to theorize the activity and in a more extensive way <clears throat> to simplify it, to, sorry, to exemplify it, never simplify, uh, as I understand and practice it. It seems fitting, at least to me, if I wish to historicize the question, that the process itself be in some sense autobiographical. How did I arrive at this perspective? When I undertook over many years in unearthing the past to tell a story about the Renaissance rediscovery of ancient sculpture, <clears throat> was I f what I found that was peculiar to m my specific instance of a sequential cultural narrative was that the instance of sculpture, nearly always sculpture depicting the human form, led to a kind of one-on-one -on -one encounter where both parties, the viewer and the art object, can came to be understood as individuals, even as sentient individuals. When Ghiberti beheld the newly unearthed statues of the hermaphrodite, and when Michelangelo witnessed the discovery of the Laocoon, they experienced, <clears throat> in addition to something properly historicist, a face-to-face -face encounter that was wholly in the present tense, quite outside historical time planes. Hence Winkelmann's account of the Torso Belvedere. It seems inconceivable that one could depict the power of thinking in any other part of the body than the head, yet witness here how the hand of the creating master has the capacity to render material into spirit. The, pre the premise being that, that spirit resides in the head, therefore no head, no spirit. But in this case, for some exceptional reason, the aesthetic uh, excellence of the discovered work, this principle was not in force. A headless torso could, in fact, embody thought. Rilke picks up this up in his amazing poem on the torso of Apollo, which, despite its unerhörtes Haupt, something like unimaginable dome, is able to see and see into its observer. When the torso in Rilke's poem declares to the viewer, du musst dein Leben ändern, you must change your life, He's picturing an encounter in which aesthesis, the aesthetic experience, as it travels from art object to viewer, is radical and absolute. To borrow somewhat out of its original context, Althusser's term, the art object interpellates the viewer, seizes her or him the way a cop seizes someone suspected of a crime. Apparently, this particular viewer-reader <clears throat> has a life that has been scrutinized by the headless torso and found to be wanting. Leaving aside Althusser's emphasis on crime and police surveillance, what is necessary here 
is that the art object knows how to read the viewer and reads that viewer down to the depths of the viewer's being. That's the way I feel <coughs> about Shakespeare. <coughs> um, and this is apparent from my book title, Reading Shakespeare, Reading Me. Uh, and therefore, the story I need to tell about Shakespeare <coughs> is a story about what in me the art object has succeeded in reading. <coughs> reading takes us from torsos back to texts. Um, we assume that the writer has a first person who is at the center of textual production, even if the conventions of certain times and places operated in such a way as to deny or erase that premise. My particular inspiration or justification in this instance <clears throat> comes not just from admitting there is a first person, but from the vehemence, even outrageousness, with which the presence, the omnipresence of the first person is asserted within the European tradition. Dante, around 1300, invented a fable in which he had the unique experience, unavailable to any other human, of purgatory in heaven without having to die. A generation or so later, Petrarch produced in both verse and prose vast collections of text with no other content than the relating of his mostly inner experiences. From there, we have to leap quite a bit further in time to the 16th century, when Montaigne first declares and then exemplifies a practice in which he tells us quite explicitly, this book is me. The me in question is radically personal. I pass over Montaigne's more brutalist self-assertions, when I dance, I dance, when I sleep, I sleep, or his discussion of his kidney stone, or his bowels, uh, <clears throat> or his summing up of the friendship with de la Boétie, parce que c'était lui, parce que c'était moi. Lui et moi are absolutes. They require no antecedent, no predicate. Most of all, I'm inspired by the radical first person when he talks about his own writing. I quote, authors communicate by some special extrinsic mark. I am the first to do so by my entire being, as Michel de Montaigne, not as a grammarian or a poet or a jurist. Naming the name, which Dante does explicitly and then Petrarch does less obliquely, is for me the measure of this insistence on the presence of the self. Now onto myself. I began to exercise the calling of professor in the early 1970s in an atmosphere where I had feel, reason to feel that my students were taking it for granted <clears throat> that the purpose of reading literature, assuming it had a purpose, was to aid and abet their continuing efforts at self-realization. It was my job, I felt, to disabuse them of this and to lead them to a sense of history and to what is essentially the otherness of literary fictions, an otherness that may be constituted uh, in the case of Dante or Shakespeare by remoteness in time but which operates <clears throat> nearly as much when the work was written yesterday and across the street. I'm heavily invested in that enterprise, and happily so. But all serious readers, remember this, know that the business of reading as analysis is a quite artificial, technical, even one might say scientific enterprise. The true, the inveterate reader enters the worlds of fictions and experiences them page by page as person-to-person -person encounters. I read Shakespeare, and I am Cleopatra. I am Mercutio. I am Othello at the same time as I am Iago. Or at the very least, I'm in a small room, alone with them, and they are speaking to me, to my life, to my experience. <clears throat> in writing, reading Shakespeare, reading me, I'm, in, I'm summoned by Bottom wearing an ass's head, by Lady Macbeth when she says she'd cheerfully bash her baby's brains out, by the marble statue that turns out to be, or turns into, uh, the revived Hermione in The Winter's Tale, by the sonnet speaker who is tortured by the sense that a man he loves is also having sex with a woman he loves, or at least desires. <clears throat> I violate the rules that I was taught and that I have taught. I ask, where does this brilliantly contrived fiction uh, actually touch me in my life? A reading of King Lear, and here's where we get to my difference from uh, Annette. <laughs> a reading of, of King Lear sums up tragic history in my own family, from which I was supposedly separated by many decades in a net of secrecy. The net proved quite porous, however, and I'm able to look back on my early life as, like Cordelia, the youngest of three, and by having escaped the immediacy of those family tragedies, <clears throat> um, being, as it seemed, the favored child. What happens if I dare to take this experience as data, as legitimate critical material for understanding Shakespeare's play, if I break the rule of distance in the face of a poetic fiction? 
What does that tell me about the obligations that come with so vivid and so ill-concealed a life of good fortune as mine? Am I Cordelia then? Although the last, not least, I loved her most, the youngest child of fairy tales. Have I unraveled the reason why she cannot play the, the game that Lear designs for her? Was it because she had reached the limit of her ability to tolerate being the all-favored child? I don't know whether Shakespeare expects us to look at Cordelia's position as burdensome. I do know that whether in childhood or adulthood, gifts always obligate. The child who is blessed by fortune, in my case being spared the horror show of, an er of earlier family history, you have to read the book to know what that is, and then in it, it's right out there, easy to read, uh, and then <clears throat> you don't even have to buy it, um, and then in addition, being blessed by a shower of attentions and gifts, fancy private schooling, a third uh, more opulent than your sisters, or in my case, brothers. This is a child whose indebtedness can never be paid off. All the while I know, of course, I am not Cordelia, nor was meant to be. What are the special qualities of my lifelong attachment to A Midsummer Night's Dream? Is it the early exposure to the glorious Max Reinhardt uh, film, or the indelible impression left from a youthful reading of Bruno Bettelheim's Uses of en Enchantment, which made me, as a teenager and ever since, <clears throat> wish I were the kind of small child who was made to understand, and so far as possible, to accept the dark side of life, such as is taught by the greatest fairy tales. <clears throat> On the more scholarly side, <clears throat> after all, scholarship too is autobiographical for me, all of the plays exotic, uh, and fictional antiquity seems to have propelled me as a fledgling scholar into the arms of Ar Abi Warburg and his disciples, who discovered the rich heritage that one of them, Edgar Wint, named as pagan, the pagan mysteries in the Renaissance. Or is it the fact that in 1979, at the precise Dante and Mezzo Cammin di Nostra Vita, I had the chance as a professional actor of performing the role of Bottom in a north side Chicago theater? Newly shorn of the ass's head, I was the mouthpiece of some of Shakespeare's greatest po prose, and I've never, in a classroom or on stage, held an audience the way the playwright enabled me to do with, I've had a dream, past the wit of man to say what dream it was. As Bottom the Weaver, I was a pagan mystery in the Renaissance. Of mothers, Shakespeare has much to say, and so do I. The savior and then potential destroyer of Rome, Coriolanus, we're told in the first five minutes of the play, <clears throat> did it all to please his mother. What kind of thing is that to say of a mighty Roman ancient hero? <laughs> Whatever might animate the heroes of Republican Rome or Imperial Rome, who collectively built a civilization of law and power, language and culture, stretching from Spain to the Baltic, from Hadrian's Wall to the Nile, while saving bar subduing barbarians and non-barbarians for something like a thousand years, they did it to please their mother? <clears throat> what did I do to please my mother? <clears throat> Bupkis, we would say in my family. <clears throat> my mother. <laughs> we'll go back to my mother. Forget about me. Uh, what did I do to please my mother, who came to America as an immigrant child and reinvented herself, working at the Stock Exchange in October of 1929, impulsively taking the train in 1933 from New York to Chicago for a single day so as to behold Sally Rand's famously shocking nude fan dance, secretly writing a novel shown only to me in which there was a hero who tried to invent himself as a Mayflower descendant American. He wanted to be, in my mother's words, to the manner born, though she didn't know until I told her that the phrase itself came from Hamlet. And how should my 10-year-old self react when a lady who knew my parents long before, a lady connected to the secret life of the family, took me aside at a family gathering and whispered conspiratorially, did you know your mother was a flapper? <laughs> What's a flapper, I asked in reply. All of this mother material turns into a close reading of the most mysterious mother, in my view, in all of literature, Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. Mysterious because we never, ever know exactly what she is thinking. As close as we come is the moment when she, watching the player queen, who is, after all, disguised, uh, designed to be some kind of mirror for her, when she says famously, <clears throat> methinks the lady doth protest too much. What the hell does that mean? The lady should shut up? The lady doesn't have anything to complain about? 
the lady is demonstrating insincerity by the extravagance of her claims that if widowed, she would ever, never, ever marry again. Viewing that Shakespearean pair of mother and son through the lens of my own childhood experience, in particular, the terrible scene they have together when the hero accuses her obliquely, but not very obliquely, of promiscuity, adultery, and conspiracy to commit murder, I end up stepping outside the safe realm where fiction remains fiction, and I declare Hamlet to be despicable, which opens the door to reflections on my own mother. From there, it's a short hop to sexuality. I reminisce about a Stratford, Connecticut production of As You Like It that I saw when I was 16. I review the wonderful gender bender plot. The girl Rosalind, played by a boy actor, dresses up as a boy and in that mode performs like a girl who exhibits what she, or is it he, uh, considers all the flighty quality of a girl. I'd love to declare that this procedure as fictionalized in the play amounted to sexual liberation for this young tremulous viewer back in 1960. I came to realize, however, that the whole generous performance thing which, of course, did not exist as an intellectual topic, even to grown-ups in 1960. I calculated that Judas Butler was four years old then. Um, uh, it puts an extraordinary burden on the subject. This particular teenage subject didn't want to be told that he could invent his own sexuality. He wanted to find one that was pre-existing pre and that he could slip into with all the comfortable fit of a favorite sweater. Far from showing the way, as you like, it was telling me that I had to bring heavy equipment to build the way, and then I might be the only person traveling on it. But how gay am I as a Shakespearean when I see even the most rudimentary production of a Shakespearean romantic comedy and the invariably heterosexual couples all come together, pairing up in the right boy-girl, boy-girl order at the end. I literally weep for joy at their happiness. Granted, it might be nice if Jake's and the bad duke of As You Like It, both of whom Shakespeare conspicuously leaves out of the happy ending, it would be nice if they went off together to take a timeshare on Fire Island, <laughs> but I don't need it. <clears throat> In the making of that response of elation of mine at the long-delayed unions and marriages, which I feel may possess more authentic weight in the category of, quote, interpretation than anything I or any other Shakespearean scholar and put down on paper. The fact that the fictional parties are heterosexual and I'm homosexual is utterly, totally irrelevant. What proportion of that circumstance is Shakespeare's own pansexuality and what proportion is mine, that too is probably irrelevant, except to say that I may have learned to be who I am in these regards because of early and constant exposure to the work of a dramatist who looked upon gender and saw far beyond binaries. A dramatist who was, in short, queer. The dream, not just the Midsummer Night's Dream, but the dream of literary criticism of, in the first person is that I might discover myself and Shakespeare at the same time. Thank you.